Hello, this is Robert Messina, and I'm here to try to encourage those that are afraid and fearful of the last seven years, and they don't want to go into the last seven years. They're afraid of it, and they are, are happy that their pastors and their teachers and their friends are, and their associates are telling them that we're going to be raptured before any of that happens because God loves us, all right? Well, I want to open up the topic with the model prayer that Jesus gave us in Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10. <clears throat> he says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. He's giving us the words that, that, that are ideal, that cover the, the whole spectrum of our needs. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now I'm going to stop there. That's enough. The part I want to point out is that he wants us to ask that his kingdom come. He wants us to want him to come. Okay? He wants us to want him to come. That's one thing. We shouldn't be afraid of his coming if indeed he's coming after. As, as the way it's written, he's coming after the sound of the last trumpet. There are seven trumpets in, in Revelation. So the seventh one is when he comes. And that's how I see it. So... And we talk about the elect, for the elect's sake, those days are shortened. He talks about the tribulation being the worst it ever is, and things like that. And then it also talks about being killed. The souls under the altar, the fifth seal. The souls under the, the, souls under the altar want vengeance. These are things to make you fear and shy away from and don't want to hear it. You, you clog your ears. You don't want to know. I don't care. God is going to help me. Yes, he's going to help you. And that's, um, that's why I'm here to tell you. He is going to help you. But you should be encouraged. And we're going to go through the, the verses. We're going to go through things that will, I hope, help encourage you to be strong. And as he says many times in, in, in his words, be able to stand. Above all, be able to stand. And we're going to get to that, those verses. And, and um, in, the, in Jacob's trouble, right before his, his escape from the calamity that the, uh, of his troubles, he had to wrestle the angel. The way he won, he didn't really beat the angel, but he stood his ground. And that's all we're asked for, to stand our ground. And I'm going to get to some of the th things we sh need to do towards the end of this. And it's not going to be that long. Now, Peter's, Peter uh, admonishes us, Second Peter 2, verse 1, there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So there's false teachers out there. And I'm going to say, I'm bold enough to say, that the false teachers are telling you, you're going to be raptured before the last seven years. And... Most Christians, you know, the way I see it, most Christians believe that. And, the, and the, the pastors that are teaching it learned it from their teachers when they went to the cemetery. I'm, I'm sorry, I mean the seminary. But that, w I, that wasn't a slip of the tongue. I, I actually wanted to include it. Okay, and, and these same kind of people uh, deny even denying the Lord that bought them. Now, how do they deny the separate from pre-trib pre -trib teaching? But the way they deny the Lord that bought them, they embrace ecumenical. Ecumenical means they embrace all religions. 
and you can go to God any way through any of them. There are many paths to 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 heaven, to be to be accepted by God, and that is denying the the Lord that bought them. Um, now that's really not the topic of this of this. I'm just, but it's included in this verse, and I wanted to point it out to you as well. The false teachers go go false, 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 false on every way they can. And there is a false prophet beast in uh, Revelation chapter 13. He's the second one. He's the guy that rules for the f time, times, and the dividing of times. All right? And he's the one that places the, uh, the image of the beast in the holy place and causes us to either worship it, fall down and worship it, or be killed. That's the part that you guys out there are afraid of. Don't be afraid of it. Why? Because you're going to have the helmet of salvation, and I'm going to get into that later, at the end of this. But there were false prophets in the days of Jeremiah. Okay, she says, there were false prophets. Uh, Peter says there were false prophets also among the people. And, the, and he's and mainly the time of Jeremiah. The time of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was telling them, hey, hey guys, if we don't straighten up, we're, uh, we're going to be taken over by Babylon. And they're going to come in and destroy us and take us captive. There were false prophets that were saying otherwise. Just one example. It's, it's plagued with, uh, you know, the false prophets in Jeremiah, but let's go to f chapter 14, verse 15. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, I sent them not. Yet they say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. And so, therefore, by sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. Now, Book of Revelation has opens it opens up uh, seven seals. The, the second seal is a sword, and and the third seal is a famine. So it, this is exactly the time that we're talking about. We're going to be talking about the exact same parallel. We are going to be uh, taken over. Our temple is going to be destroyed, and uh, spiritually, and we're going to be taken captive. And those are the words describing the, the last days, too. Okay, now I want to go back to this verse now again and look and, and uh, give a warning to those that teach others and believe themselves that these false prophets were saying, sword and famine shall not be in this land. The result of what they what they false prophesied, where he said he said I sent them not, yet they say sword and famine shall not be in this land, but by sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. I'm uh, emphasizing this as a warning. Okay, because I I totally believe that those false prophets were judged and sword and famine consumed those prophets and the second seal is a uh, sword and the third seal is famine there's sword and famine in the seven years and you're saying a christian doesn't have to even worry about it it's not going to happen to, to us we're not going to be there well, you better get it. You better get it straight. You better get it straight, because if the, if he judged these guys, it would. It's very, very, very possible he's going to be judging those false teachers as well. And and anybody who is a pre-trib, and he's convinced of it, they they can have a uh, a debate with me about that. Number one, I'm, I welcome it. I'll record the debate so we'll get all the, all the arguments out. And, all the, uh, and I'll, put, I'll be able to point out everything they say 
and I'll, I'll stab it with my sword. The rule of the debate, though, you can bring out any verse you want. It has to be a verse from the Bible. It can't be some, something somebody else said, or it can't be a commentary. It has to be a verse from the Bible. And you have to read the verse, and you can interpret the verse the way you want. That's fine. Because everybody, is, there's, there's no ownership to any interpretation. It's, uh, interpretation is everybody's. But after you interpret it, you can't add to your interpretation. In other words, you look at the verse, and the verse says, he who lets will let, and that's the Holy Spirit, and then he's taken out of the way, and therefore he, that, and now, then he's taken out of the way, is all it says. And if you add, he goes up into heaven, that's adding. You can't add. You're not allowed to add. When you want to debate, you can't add the words to your interpretation. Because I, first of all, I agree with your interpretation that it is the Holy Spirit that lets, and then he's taken out of the way. But when he's taken out of the way, he stays on earth and does everything he has to do. Everything he has to do has, still has to be done. It's not the end yet. And, and as far as the people that, for the elect's sake, that says that, the days will be shortened for their sake, which I think is our sake. Um, those are the people that are saved during the uh, tribulation. Okay, but the, I thought you just said the Holy Spirit went out, went up to, into heaven. Didn't you? Didn't you say that? Oh, okay, you said that. And those people are getting saved by just the words. By they they, they got a Bible someplace and they're reading it and there's words. Well, where's the preachers? All the preachers left, didn't they? Uh, okay, but well, you know, this isn't this is not the place for the debate. It just comes into play because it comes into play because if you think you're not going in it, you don't really care. I'm trying to open up your ears right now. I'm trying to give you oil in your lamp. Okay, rem remember this, if you're afraid, uh, again, to encourage you. Jesus encouraged me when he said these words, in Ma and it was the, the very last verse in Matthew. Jesus was teaching them to observe all things whatsoever he has commanded you. Observe all things whatsoever he has commanded you. And most of that command, though, most of those commands... The Torah of the New Testament is, is Matthew 5 through 7. The laws, the instructions. And they supersede the Old Testament. And he supersedes the Old Testament commands, which the Pharisees uh, adhered to. And they thought as long as they didn't sleep with the woman, and they, and they never did that, they were good. But Jesus said, "You have to. You have your righteousness. Our righteousness has to be more than that. We have to be more than the Pharisee. The Pharisee uh, righteousness. We have to not only not do it. We have to not think it in our mind. So you see, you see, this is what we have. This is one of the things to do. This is where we um, bind up our loins with truth." That's what that is, what I just said. And then after he says, whatsoever he has commanded you, and lo, he is with you always, even to the end of the world. So it's not like we're going to be in, the, in this whole thing without him, even though it's gonna, it might feel like that. It might feel like he doesn't even hear us because he... Because we're going to be helped with little help, as Daniel said. And then he says, "Amen." So yeah, in every book, every book has "Amen" except the Acts. Acts has no "Amen," and that's because Acts are still being, are always being done until the day he comes back, and it's all over. No more Acts of his believers. The way Malachi said it. In other words, in other words, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a heavy testing. Malachi 3, 2, he says, but who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. He's going to be making us white. 
like a fuller's soap and like a refiner's fire. Refiner's fire refines the gold. The, the heat refines the gold. And um, our faith is like gold. And the things are, are the things that we the troubles that we fall into refines our faith, as James says. And we will get robes of righteousness like a full white robes of righteousness, like fuller's soap would clean it. It would be nice and clean at the end, be right, bef right before the last trumpet, we're going to be completely cleansed. The, the, the uh, sanctuary shall be completely ch cleansed, as Daniel said. Okay, so um, there were gone. Basically, there are two tests, two major tests that we have we're going to have to go through in the tribulation. One is we can't worship the image of the beast, that the false prophet is going to um, make us do, and if we don't do it, we'll be killed. And this is what part, this is a thing that we fear, but you shouldn't fear it. We're also going to have to not take mark of the beast. We have to not take the mark of the beast lest we can't buy or sell. We can't, we want to buy and sell so that, you know, as a father, you want to feed your family. You can't do it. You have to trust in God. Now, the, both, of the, both of those trials are exemplified in the book of Daniel, and the, they were saints of God that passed the tests, and that's why it's so relevant. Now, uh, one was in Daniel 6, and this happened, okay. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that so whosoever shall ask a petition of any god for, uh, or man for 30 days save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. And this is the one, this is the temptation that, that Daniel had to go through. Daniel himself. The other three had another one. I, I, I thought it was interesting that it says for 30 days because I think the trials, may, maybe even both trials, at least one of them is going to come in the, in the time of the fifth seal. And I believe that the, the fifth seal is only going to last 30 days. I don't really feel like going into that reason. I have said it uh, in other videos. And um, if you want to ask me, you know, why, it's too long. I, I'll point you to what um, the best video to watch. But anyway, they have this firm decree. Firm. In other words, it's they're going to enforce it. It's a royal statute, and this is done by all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, and the captains. They all consult together to do this, and the king agrees. Now, Daniel used to pray all the time, and everybody knew. And this is the reason, the reason they did it, because they wanted to get Daniel. They, they were... Daniel was uh, their enemy. They wanted to accuse him. And they wanted him to take, be him taken out of the picture. Just like Satan wants to get us out of the picture. Okay? Because we don't worship the beast. We don't take our commands from the beast. We still take our commands from God. We are still going to maintain that we're Christian. We don't, we're not going to deny him. But they wanted Daniel to, to, to deny, because how, was, how was that going to happen? Because they knew Daniel prayed every day out in the open. And they saw, he, he went on his balcony and everybody saw him praying. Because he wanted to go pray to, pray towards Jerusalem. This is what he thought, the way he did it. So they make this commandment. And what is Daniel going to do? Not, not do it. Just pray by himself and then make sure. No, because if if he didn't do it, it would almost be like 
him fearing man and not fearing God, the God who he serves. So he wasn't afraid of them. He was going to do what he does, what he has been doing, knowing that he was going to be persecuted and cast into the den of lions. So he wins that test. He, he, he does the prayer on, the, on, the, on his balcony, and they grab him, and they throw him into the den of lions. All right? The, den of, the lions don't, don't bite. The lion's mouth are shut. Because he's alive, the king now takes those men that wanted to accuse him. Uh, verse 24, And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. Them and their children and their wives and the lions had mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. Okay, and notice that, you know, they threw the men and their children and their wives. Why? Because those men were also inhibiting other members of the faith that had children and wives and was really sorely tempted to deny and take it's like it's like it's like you, the, the man doesn't want it's like the man wants to take the mark of the beast so because he wants to feed his children and he wants to feed his wives i mean he, if he was all alone it wouldn't be as much as the temptation if the man didn't take the mark Maybe his children and wives would be would would starve to death. I personally don't think that you're going to die if you take the if you don't take the mark, but you might. Okay. The other uh, foreshadow example that this is now this actually happened. So it's, it's it's not even a it's not a prophecy, but it's an example of what is going to happen. That already happened, and it's going to happen again. Uh, Daniel three fifteen. If ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the carp, the, so the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you have to fall down and worship the image which I have made. So, the, so this is going to happen. And again, and again, I think it's going to be the fifth seal at the time of the fifth seal. When men are killed and under the altar and they're worshiping the, and they're asking for vengeance uh, of of the people that did this to them, that's my it's my guess, all right. But it doesn't matter. It's going to happen. Ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. This is a decree again from the king, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, men of God from Jerusalem. And they didn't. They didn't want to worship an image, and they want which they knew was law, unlawful for them to bow down to have any other gods before them. They knew that. Now, it's well with you if you do worship the image, but if you don't worship the image, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that? shall deliver you out of my hands. So they threw them into the uh, fiery furnace, but they weren't consumed. They had no smoke. And, and there was a fourth person who looked like the Son of God. So they passed the test. They passed the test. And, and um, a good thing about their faith, though, they told him, they told the king, if it be so, our God whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. He will deliver us out of thine hands, O king. And that enraged the, the king, and he says uh, in verse 17, Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, as the form of his visions was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times more than it was want to be heated. So they heated, they made it hotter. They made it really, really, he was really annoyed and 
now let's go to uh, Luke 18, verse 2 through 6. Now, this parable, parable of praying, Luke 18, is, comes right after Luke 17, which talks about the end times and the hardships. There'll be help with little help, but he's not saying not to keep praying. He's not saying, it'll be like he, he doesn't even hear you, but he's telling, letting you know he still will hear you. And this is the parable. Saying, there was in a, in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard men, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust says. He wants us to hear what the ju unjust judge says. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on earth. Okay, so the souls under the altar are going to want vengeance the way this woman wanted vengeance. And they're under the altar, so they actually lost in the sense that they died and they were killed. They're under the altar and they're, and they're asking for vengeance of what was happened to them. This is the kind of thing that scares us. It's not something to be afraid of, though, because God is with us, even in this time. Revelation 13, 6, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. The blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. You notice that to blaspheme his name, okay? The name, he wants to blaspheme his name. Why? Because he doesn't, he wants to try to erase his name and put his own name in that, in that place. And that's really Satan. Satan wants to own, Satan wants ownership of worship, total ownership of worship. And right now, his name is in the way. And his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven, including the angels of God, because he has his own, he has his own third of the angels that, with, that are with him. And this goes back to, uh, this relates to Genesis 11, 4. And they said, go, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So they wanted a name that was going to be a God name. So when he's blaspheming against God and blaspheming his name, making himself equal as God, he is taking the place of God, trying to. And I don't know why, I don't know what th thought they have that building a tower that goes up into heaven is going to do that. But right now, this guy is blaspheming, and he's against God, and he's, his words are going right up into heaven, right into his face. Now, verse 7, of back to Revelation, verse 7 says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, overcome them. And, his, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. See, it's almost like he's... He's done it. Well, he's done what he wanted to do. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life. So not everybody worships him. And we cannot worship him. 
We cannot worship the image of him. We cannot take his mark. We cannot not not do what we shouldn't do. We shall, we shall have no other gods before us. Okay. If any man have ear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity, so we are going to go into captivity, shall go into captivity. So the guy who's leading us into captivity is going to go into captivity. This is the vengeance. This is the part that's being, that, that he's avenging our, so, our souls. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword shall be killed with the sword. And here is the patience and faith of the saints. So we should have patiently and faithfully uh, know that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Okay, going back to uh, Revelation, where I think this, this killing and stuff is. Revelation 6, 9. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost that now, does now not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So they want justice. They want vengeance on those people that killed them. Eleven, and white robes were given unto every one of them. See, that's the, the, so they got, they're sanctified, they're with the fullest soap, they're all white, they're all clean, they're all ready, and they have really nothing to worry about. They've already passed the test. It's a good, this is a good place to be. Under that altar is a good place to be. You, you know, to die and have the white robes, he's coming very, right, almost right after this, there's almost no wait, waiting time, because it's just a little. It's just a little bit, and it was said unto them that they should rest for yet for a little season. Now this is during the fifth seal. So during the sixth seal and the seventh, I think all throughout, because the 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 false prophet beast rules all the way up until the last trumpet, and so does and the and the beast. Is alive also all the way up. You just don't have the the you don't have the Antichrist, the man, but you still have the beast right up until the last trumpet. So they are still warring. We're still in war during the seven trumpets. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So it's written down who's going who's gonna to be killed and who's not. And we don't know that. We don't have to know it. If we are, we are. If we're not, we're not. We're gonna, now we're going to talk about putting on the whole armor of God. And this is where uh, I'm going to mention why you shouldn't have to worry about it. Because you have the whole armor of God. You have to have the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to, be, to stand. You may be able to stand. That's what you got to do. You got to be able to stand. That's all you got to do. You don't have to win. You got to be able to stand your ground against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand, see, stand, in the evil day, in the evil day, the tribulation times. Not that it's not evil today. It still applies to today. Having done all, to stand. See? To stand. How many times is he going to say stand? Well, he says it again. In the next verse, he says, Stand, therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness. Breastplate of righteousness. 
Your loins gird about with truth. Now, remember that when I was saying about how your loins got to be girded about with truth so that you oh, so that you don't so that your righteousness is more than the Pharisees okay you can't be sinning if you're sinning it you you're losing the battle we, he wants you to stand he doesn't want you to sin and it includes your mental thoughts your lust that's in your mind so you got to you got to work on it and this is the preparing for him to come prepare prepare ye the way of the lord is the voice that cries in the wilderness about repentance and righteousness and stuff okay let's go on and having the breastplate of righteousness okay now the breastplate of righteousness is over your heart that's a breastplate a breastplate is over your heart your heart and your mind your heart is where you have your faith and trust and belief that is stapled right onto your heart so that it's not like the rest of your body the rest of your body is except for your helmet you know and your and your feet the, the the shield has to take care of the rest of the body but the breastplate of righteousness is his blood atonement is given unto you for your righteousness so you become completely clean and it was given to you by what he did for you he atoned for all of your sin and therefore all you got left is righteousness and you be able you're able to be born again as a son of god and that is complete righteousness there's no unrighteousness in being a son of god but if you walk after the flesh and not after the spirit, if you're walking after the flesh, you're walking after the old man, and you're you're really not abiding in him. You're 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 outside of him, doing what the old man of sin used to want to do. As a son of God, you have to completely abide in him. Very important. Okay, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Of peace that's an important thing because it's sort of like part of the love of God you still have to have the love of God the love of God is love of him and love of the of your neighbor it's your neighbor that you want to to share that gospel with who, who those that are in your vicinity and your feet wherever you go that gospel of peace should be with you all right and uh, that's a that's an area you, you, when your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel it's an area where you don't get accused that's why I said that's why that's what I think that um, your bre your, your your shield of faith which is the next thing doesn't really have to go down that far and it doesn't have to go over in front of your your breastplate and it doesn't go have to go onto your head but all the rest of the parts of your body, it has to, it has to, uh, okay, let's keep going here. Taking, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all fiery darts of the wicked. So those are the things that's going to happen to us. We're going to have fiery darts. And now those are going to be uh, uh, accusations. It's also going to be hindrances and it's going to be illnesses and sickness your eyes might be be uh, attacked or your your ears or your uh, or your legs you know the, all, anything that's not near your, your breastplate of righteousness everything else is going to be attacked whether it be sickness or whether it be physical bruise or whether it be uh, I, I don't know Will it be stones? I don't know. Well, anyway, that's that shield of faith would be ha has to be able to quench all fiery darts of the wicked. The next two are the most important parts of the armor, I think. Now, the first one: take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation 
is um, not only a defense, but it's an offense. And it's an offense because it encourages you to go into the fight with your with the sword of the spirit, which is the next, which is the, the other, the other great uh, weapon you have. It's like the is the skinny little quarterback gonna do a quarterback sneak without a helmet? No, he's not. But with a helmet, he's encouraged and he's able and he knows that he can just push through the pile and um, get the extra six inches or the extra yard or whatever it is. Those, that's what a quarterback sneak does. And it wouldn't happen if he didn't have the helmet of his sal- the helmet. And the helmet of salvation is telling you that even you go into the battle and even you go into the test and even if they kill you, you are still going to live because you have the helmet of salvation. You know that he said you shall live and you do live. The souls under the altar are given white robes. They live. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, it's the Word of God in, in um, what you know of, what, of the Bible, Bible verses. It's, it's the Bible verses that you're able to defend yourself and attack with. But it's also what God is going to... Let's go to Mark 13, 9 through 11. Now, this is, this is right after he's talking about the end times, by the way. So it's in context. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. So that's, see, before the end can absolutely come, the gospel must be published for, among all the nations. So... That's almost, that's almost done. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak. See? Neither do you premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speaks, but the Holy Ghost. Now, a good example of allowing the Holy Spirit to do his job, fill your mouth with the words that um, will deliver you from uh, a judgment, is found in Acts 23, where he gets that wisdom to speak. The rest is the deliverance part of how he's delivered from it. So it's really not, he doesn't really need a lot of words to get out of it, but a few. And... um, that's typically what is going to happen, you know, when the Lord gives you wisdom. It's going to be a, not, it's not going to be a big, long Bible study. Okay. Acts 23, 6 through 9. But when Paul perceived that the one part were, were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. So that's what he was preaching, that Jesus is the resurrection and stuff. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. But the Pharisees confessed both, and there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken unto him, let us not fight against God. I think that this is an example of the Lord filling his mouth with the wisdom and words to say, when when you, when we're in a persecuting uh judgment type scenario
So some of us are going to be alive when the, the Lord comes back to, to take us. And some of us will be dead, because, but the dead will be raised first. We that are alive will be changed. So there'll be, there will be saints alive when he comes back and go th all through the entire tr uh, tribulation period without being killed. And they will escape some of that persecution and some of that, um, tr those trials through the wisdom that God is going to give us. So that is our sword of the spirit that we fight with. It is the spirit that is going to fight for us through our mouths mostly. And knowing that you're saved is going to encourage you th that you, no matter what happens, you are going to be saved. You have the promise of, of everlasting life. And you have to hold on to that. We all have to hold on to that. Right up to the end. Those that, are, that have died in this tribulation period will be raised first. The dead in Christ shall be raised first. And we who are alive will all be changed. We're going to get a new body and everything. We're going to have strength and we're going to soar like, spirit, like eagles. It is going to be something good. I mean, the whole idea that you're trusting in God and knowing God is love and knowing he loves you and he knows, he knows your hurts and feelings and everything, especially in the tribulation time. That's about all I'm going to say right now, okay? God loves you people. Please don't be afraid.